Yeah, okay, so um, let, let me just start by saying that, that um, most of the things that I'm going to be share, sharing here are mainly preliminary um, data, uh, pre, I mean, preliminary um, results from the analysis that I've been doing from our long-term egg collection data in Z Z Zambia. And um, so I've just tried to put it to together in a way that will re re relate to the, to the whole idea of citizen science and what you can actually use this um, egg collection data to do or some other form, form of citizen science uh, the data like um, observations during the bed um, at last or even cultural observations from when people farm and when people organize cultural events and things like that. So it's just to be able to put it in that context, but I'll be sharing specifically what we've been able to see from the egg collection data that um, has been collected by mostly one person in a single location in Zambia. Like I said, it will be very preliminary. And these are um, this mostly um, work done by other people rather than myself. I'm just having this real privilege of um, looking at the data, analyzing it, and trying to, um, um, and then eventually going to try to tell a story about what we find from from uh, from the analysis uh, just to okay fine um so um yes yeah, so um i have actually been looking at um like seasonality in different parts of Africa. That is because uh, most of the previous uh, work I did for trying to understand avian seasonality was from JAWS. And, um, and especially working with the common booboo alone. And there has been that danger of making a lot of explain, uh, making a lot of interpretation from a single species in a single location. So I'm beginning to um, lo lo look at other locations and uh, uh, and what, what's actually going on there to be able to um, correct some of the wrong no notions that I got earlier, or, and also be able to tell a more complete story about how environmental seasonality affect um, uh, bird breeding season, seasonality. So more recently, I've been look, look, looking at um, insect sampling and um, rainfall part from JAWS, from um, WEPA, from a, a place called a Lat in Cameroon, and also from a, um, Choma in Zambia, where I will talk to you uh, more about the egg collection data from uh, the day. So let me just do a just a quick. Um, let me just show you briefly about some of the the things we 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 you used to know about the breeding seasons in the, the different places. So this 1950 issue of IVB is one that I find very interesting. In that, there were actually um, this article detailing um, kind of the, the uh, trying to talk about the reason why birds have a particular breeding season in a particular place in, in the world. So, like uh, Lack brought in the data from the from from Europe and um, other parts of the Northern Hemisphere. And then there, were, there was data from Indonesia, then uh, data from Africa, and then from the Galapagos. And then this was all summarized together. So in this um, 
um, issue. If you read through it, it was almost as, as if um, we were getting an explanation of um, how and why birds breed um, when they do in different parts of the, 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 the world. It looked almost complete as at the, the time. So um, most of um, what was um, there uh, around the, the, the time was a lax idea as, as, as about uh, birds breeding according to the amount of resources available to them. So he was ta 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 talking about, about uh, ten things like um, the population sizes limited by food supply, and like every uh, and like birds will will uh, lay uh, their clutch size will be as as large as the food available in the environment. And so most of the thoughts about the timing of birds breeding was related to when food can be found in the environment to raise the um, the the uh, the, ch 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 the the chicks that came from their from the uh, from the from the clutch size babies technically then we had some other refining ideas by by um Scotch. he was more about some um intrinsic fa 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 um, some intrinsic factors like uh, disease and then other factors like pre 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 predation that can affect an individual so the population was not just regulated by food but by the fact that um, diseases and predation and all this can actually um, affect the number of birds in the um, moment and so survive survival now um, uh, was uh, became a, an important factor to to be con 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 considered when you're looking at annual reproductive rate so this was more seen as like the adjusted reproductive rate based on other factors in the environment the, 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 there, were, there were then also uh, more um, refining ideas that came from um, Chris' parents. So, so some of you would remember Chris' parents visiting around around the, the mid, um, uh, yeah, I think around 2005 or yes, some, something like, like, like that. So um, Chris published an, a very influential paper where he, he he made a very strong point about the breeding season not just being re related to the amount of food that would be available for the chain chicks, but that the breeding season was also adjusted to the time that a parent would be able to have um, enough food to bring themselves to the to a good con condition to to um, to be able to lay um, to lay the to, to lay the, 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 the uh, 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 say. So breeding season did, did not just select for having enough food to feed the, the chicken chicks, but also putting the breeding parent in good condition. And then uh, a little bit more um, recently, though compared to earlier ideas by David Lack, you see the whole idea of prudence. You cannot walk beyond what your your body can carry. So the the the, the, the uh, so the um, the, the, the um, idea be, be, became that um, uh, parents made a decision to breed or not to breed, uh, de de depending on condition and the resources available to 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 de them. But uh, one thing that we see um, is that um, our ornithology is in Africa over the last few years have stuck with the idea of food. Even though we have this huge variability in the timing of uh, breeding across species, but we've kind of just held on to that central idea of food being 
very available in, in the wet season, even though sometimes we don't really measure it com 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 compared to not having enough food in the dry season. And we're thinking, oh, the big breeding season is in the wet season when there's a lot of, of food. So during my uh, PhD, I worked on the common bull 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 bull. And the idea was to use the wet season, dry season to try to understand how um, immune function changes in time. But to do that, I, need, I then realized that I was actually supposed to define the breeding season of this species because all we thought we knew, we just thought uh, uh, about. And so we went, went out every day for two years and it, uh, at least when we were not stopped by rain or, or, or the um, constraints, train and we caught birds, um, checked whether they were breeding, checked whether they, they, they were um, molting. We found out that um, birds could breed at any time in the, the, the year, although there, there was a clear small peak just at the end of the dry sea season and at the around the, the beginning of the wet season. So if you like, at that transition between the dry season and the wet season. But what, what was even more, much more striking was the fact that despite this weak breeding seasonality, birds still bred, I mean, birds still molted at about the same time in the year. And this was con con consistent between the, the first year we collected data and the second year that we collected data. So uh, it, appeared as if birds would always prioritize the timing of, uh, of, uh, of their um, molting and would keep it around the same time in the, the, the year, even if they are able to breed much more flexible. Yeah. Like I said, um, this was a single species from a single location. <laughs> And so we, after the PhD, I co collaborated with a few more people and just recently were able to analyze year round data from common bulbuls in Cameroon and in Wepa, somewhere south of Jos. And um, we, so we, we then just to, to give you a little bit of, of a background to compare the rainfall pattern since in Wepa, um, you see that the, the rain starts a bit earlier in Cameroon compared to, um, to, to this part of southern Nigeria. And we saw from the food, um, uh, from, from the food, food sampling the, day, the data that the annual food uh, peak in Cameroon also comes earlier. And then from the atropopod data that the peak in atropod abundance in, in Cameroon was also um, earlier than in Nigeria. But then when you uh, look at the uh, mold data, you, you, then, uh, be, you then see so, so, uh, uh, somewhat surprising result where the birds in Wepa in Nigeria seem to have an earlier mold uh, peak compared to the mold peak in Cameroon, which you would not expect if the timing of re resources followed a pa pattern that was consistent with the onset of the wet season. And then when you look at uh, breeding, it, it is, then you see that the breeding peak in Nigeria and the breeding peak in Wepa seem to be se se separated by about six months. Um, this was also very so, so surprising. But, but one thing that remained consistent was that the timing of molt remained seasonal despite this flexibility. Because one interpretation that we had for the breeding data is that this breeding peak that we are picking from one year of year round data might just be that there are actually uh, multiple PP peaks for breeding in, in the, the year that you don't see every uh, year, year. And if breeding is spread out throughout, throughout the, the year, the um, uh, peak uh, 
uh, when you when you compare the peak it's in one location in one year versus in uh, versus versus in uh, another location in the same year it might not just give you a true reflection of the breeding uh, peak just as i said it's one species just that now is in two lo lo locations and it still gives you limited um, um, amount of information for interpreting over um, broad um, scale about uh, the timing of breeding seasons in maybe Afrotropical species, even if you reduce to that. So a few years ago, um, um, Claire and Gabe and a few other colleagues actually introduced me to a field site in Zambia. And what's very striking about this field site is that uh, a certain egg collector who was a tobacco uh, farmer, he used to belong to the British, um, British army in Zambia. And he, after his, his car, career in the army, he went into tobacco farming. And so in his past, time he would always uh, collect um, um he would collect um eggs from the breeding birds around around choma where he did his tobacco farm <laughs> but but one very striking thing about his his um, egg collection was that he kept detailed records very important it's this information about like the egg size the date he co co collected it clutch sizes and like his notebooks showed very very detailed information and so we thought we could actually extract these uh, dates as um uh, and use them as an index of when birds actually um laid eggs in this area. So these eggs you see are now um, held at the, at the Livingstone Museum in Zambia. But we were using the digitized data from the major notebook. And so just to give you a little bit of a background about the environmental seasonality in Zambia so that you can get a, a uh, a clearer picture of how we can then use this egg information to try to construct the breeding seasonality of these uh, species. So in Zambia, unlike in Nigeria, the wet season starts around, um, uh, around November. So you see a little bit of rain in October and then you get your peak wet season around January. And then by April, the um, rainy season is coming to an end. This is just the opposite of what you have in Nigeria, where the rain starts around April and ends uh, at the end of September or just around mid-October. So it's just a flip of the um, coin somehow when you compare between uh, rainfall seasonality in Zambia versus in Nigeria, but as seasonal as it is, uh, though, just at the other um, side. Then if you look at the temperature, the data, you would then see the, the, that the lowest temperature in the year is somewhere around, um, around July. And then the temperature then begins to rise slowly through August until you have the highest temperature around November. And then it begins to drop up again with the wet season until you get the coldest period in the year around July and August. So we uh, did, uh, we, we spread that out all this egg, uh, um, collection data from all the spe species where we had enough the, the data from, from the major collection. 
And um, just to urge you not to worry so much uh, uh, about uh, the labeling of the species, it's just to show you the, we had like about 300 species from which we were able to pull the data together so that we can get an overall um, impression of the timing of the breeding uh, season. But, but just quickly to show you that these are not just mere numbers, but um, species from which this data was collected. But let's go back to the, the, the data. So, so these are basically dates from eggs that were um, collected. And what they tell you is when each egg in this collection was laid. And that's basically what you need to tell when the birds breed and whether the timing of breeding has changed over uh, time. And, and these eggs here were collected around over a 40 year uh, period from about 1969 to about 2006, um, um, shortly before the major past turn. So um, just a reminder about the, the environmental seasonality. Re remember, I pointed out that July was the driest part, uh, driest and coldest around the dry and very cold part of the, 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 the year. So if you look at the rainfall and the temperature. So what we did was to divide the um, year around this point because the calendar year doesn't really mean much to a bird. So it, it, it's what we, we, we thought it was the best to, to kind of start the year from the, from the variation in environmental condition that um, was taking place. So we thought the coldest part of the year, the driest part of the year. And then when you spread the data for every species, um, we then identified the first month. So on the y-axis here, you had all the time where you saw um, eggs for every species, and then how many species you were finding there based on the record. So each of this line on the heat map here uh, tells you the intensity of breeding for every species. So we identified the first month for each species, and then the peak of, um, of breeding for that species based on egg collection, and for how long that species was breeding. And when, when I mean how long the species was breeding, it's not the annual duration, but pulling all the data together and looking at the spread of breeding records for these species. Then just to um, um, balance these measures a little bit, we also took the mean, because when the spread in the data is not as, um, you, you, it's, not no, it's not normally distributed, so to, to speak, you find out that the mean, median, and mood are not exactly the, the same. So just to balance this a little bit, we also took the mean of this uh, breeding dates. And with these four parameters, what we did was to calculate a principal component. And you, you can see that the two first at 82% of the variation in the breeding dates that we see across all species. So we plotted the first principal component against the second principal component and do uh, like a, to get a simple description of the breeding clusters in this environment. And what we see are three somewhat unique breeding clusters. So um, if you use the heat map here, so um, yeah, so this would be your y axis here would represent the um, start 
and the the, the start and duration of uh, breeding based on the two parameters that loaded strongly with about 26 p p percent while the uh, pc1 here on your x um, axis represents the start date and the peak of the breeding season so if you look at that on 2d here you see this very cluster of wet season breeding species and these are species that will breed uh, with their peak at the end of the wet sea season so uh, technically you would assume that they actually wait for the rain to start and even peak before you get their own breeding peak, uh, breeding uh, uh, peak whereas this cluster here in blue actually peaked somewhere around october so from uh, you start seeing uh, breeding before august and then peaking around the, the october and then by november the the december they drop off completely and only a few species around that time have a uh, peak yeah uh, peak. But let me just point out one thing that is very striking about this group is that this peak, if you remember the timing of the wet season, which I tried to bring up um, um, yeah, uh, uh, twice, I said the rain starts around November. And you can see that the peak breeding for this group of species is actually just before the onset of the rains, which is a bit contrary to the general idea that we used to have that rainfall is the start of environmental productivity in seasonally arid tropical environment. So we should think that once the rain starts, then environmental productivity kicks in and then birds begin to uh, breed. But here we see clearly that most species have their peak even before the onset of the uh, even before the onset of rainfall and this tells us that there's either some level of environmental productivity that the birds depend on or that the breeding actually anticipates the onset of the wet season so that maybe food is available for the uh, for the young birds to to feed on when they uh, be, when they leave the nest but one thing that you cannot rule out is the fact that there's still sufficient productivity to have the parents in good condition to lay the eggs and raise the young. So let me quickly go back to the last cluster uh, here, where you see a group of species that um, breed much more flexibly. So there are species with a bit of a longer breeding du duration, all clustered in the third place. So if you try to do a brief summary of uh, breeding seasons for this entire breeding assemblage, you, see, you, you, you can say that there are three groups of species. Those breeding at the end of the wet season, those breeding at the beginning of the wet season and the end of the dry season, and those who are a bit more flexible with the long breeding duration and are capable of breeding at different parts of the, the year, although not for every species, but for the entire group of species in the cluster. So if we spread this data again out on 2D, just to try to um, ask the question, how does a single wet season influence multiple breeding community? Because if you have one breeding season, I mean one wet season, how do you have the rain affecting species with breeding peaks over a long period of time? And some of the preliminary things that we are thinking about for now is that for this cluster, the red cluster here that breed at the end of the, the, the wet season or way into the, the wet season, Sea season. It is likely that they depend on the timing of the onset of the wet season or how rapidly um, the rain starts or, the, to or the, the total amount of rainfall at the beginning of the wet season. So that for this cluster, it might be important for the rain to start early and for there to be a lot, uh, for there to be enough rain 
to to influence the timing of their own breeding peak. But then what about these guys um, here? They breed and have their peak before the rainfall. If they are affected by the same um, rainfall, then it might be the rainfall of the year B4. And this will not be a direct response to say the onset of the rainfall, but maybe the total amount of rain in the wet season before or the duration of the breeding season or how long the, the rain lasted. Because if you compare this uh, heat map here, for example, you would see that in some years, so this one, two, three, you can see here, are uh, actually rainfall for different um, years. And you see that in some years, like the year here, you see that there's a little bit more rain a bit later. So perhaps the rain at the end of the wet season or even the little rainfall you get in the dry sea season might be able to sustain some um, ground water level at a point where the trees are still accessing it. And that might drive the leaf flush that you find before the rain starts. And that might influence insect availability and productivity even before the rain starts. But these are things that we're still looking at at the preliminary level and trying to understand the full details. So one thing that we intend to do is to use climate envelope models to go back a full year before this peak and find out the rainfall and temperature a window that predicts the occurrence of this peak every year in the annual cycle. Uh, yeah, every year from these several years of data that we, um, yeah, that we we are looking kicking at. So a few more ten, things that we intend to do with, with this the data is we are looking at over three hundred species here. So we would want to see how the phylogenetic relationship among these species and the species traits like the ecological traits and some of their life history traits like um, whether a species is a fruit giver or an insectivore, the plot sizes of the spe uh, spe species, the survival of that uh, species, and several other factors that de de describe a species, how they uh, predict whether a species is in cluster one, cluster two, or cluster three. Some other things that we, we also intend to do is to see how these breeding peaks are re related overall to the um, to the peak of uh, food availability, like the peak of insect availability, and also the peak of uh, the availability of grass uh, um, grass um, grass um, seeds. So far, we've collected um, insects for a full um, for full year. And we also have grass seeds, and we're already in the we're already pro processing the, the data to tie that together with the breeding seasonality that we've been able to describe from this um, the data. And then we also test the role of pre-rain um, green up because recently we are getting more and more evidence of. Um, the onset of environmental productivity before the, um, the rain. And some authors have speculated that um, it's advantageous for the trees to already begin to grow new leaves, even be before the rain starts, because that allows them to avoid the high predation from um, um, from um, from insects that, that will um, feed on the, their leaves, assuming that there's a big flush of insects when the rain starts. But well, from some of the things that we see from the insect data that we already um, that we already um, have, we see that there's already a peak in insect abundance even before the rain, rain starts. Although we don't rule out the the, the 
the fact that that relationship is there because the different taxa of insects seem to peak at different parts of the, the year. So the insects that, 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 that will feed on, say like tree leaves might, might come after the rain starts. So it might be advantageous for the trees to already have their leaves strong and fortified with um, uh, tannins and so on before there's a flush of insects. So just a quick uh, recap. Um, so everything I've tried to talk to, to you about this um, data is just about what we can do with a simple collection like this. Sometimes we can look at egg collection and think about it as a very, um, yeah, because of the ethical consideration associated with it. We can look at it as a very terrible bulletin and something that should never be, be uh, done. But, but, but the question is that if this data is already available and held up some, somewhere, um, what should we do with, with, with it? I, I hope that, that I've shown uh, you that, that, that these museum collections can be very important source of, um, of uh, phenology data, especially for an addressing um, questions about climate change. Because when we are trying to talk about whether birds have changed their breeding phenology over time, we, we we need a very long uh, uh we need a very a long a very long term time series of the day data to be able to do that and both for plants and birds and even insect collection we're beginning to see that museum space space placements are a very useful source of information so you have access to um, to documentation, and this must not be um, egg collection or bed collection or pepper collection. It can be also the timing of um, events like the New Year Festival, for an example. It might be the timing of all the traditional things you, you do with respect to the timing of rainfall and when there's high temperature or low temperature. This information can be pulled together and they can tell us how uh, these activities have changed in response to change in weather conditions over time. We also see from this the data that um, when we look at tropical species in detail, because of the huge amount of variation that the um, that they capture. We can tell a lot about how um, birds organize their annual cycle. Because more recently, we begin to get more interested in looking at the annual cycle in general, rather than just looking at a, a, a single event like breeding or just molting. The last thing would be just keep good records. Whatever observation you make, whether you use it or you just store it, it is good to keep very important record. These several years after this collection was made, but because of the meticulous way in which the data was collected, we're able to extract this same form nation to be able to analyze this breeding data is in a um is in uh is in a way that the major himself did not think of looking at breeding seasons i can almost uh bet that he never thought that um his data would be used in this way, because from what I understand, he was much more fascinated about good parasitism and just the eggs themselves, rather than the timing of the egg um, laying. Okay, I would like to appreciate so many groups and organizations that kind of uh, provided funding and different support during the um, time when I was looking at this the data and for some of the preliminary things I showed you. So yeah, thank you for listening, hoping that you're still with 
<laughs> and I'm happy to answer any questions that you uh, may have um, been think thinking about. Thank you once again. Of election day, and how do you um, how do you account for those? Or do you just do you just hope that they it all because there's so much data that it all comes out, or, or are there are there any systematic biases that you might find in in a data set like the the majors collection? Um, yeah, so yeah, that's a very, 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 very good question. Yeah, it was something, yeah, that um, has been um, like bothering on, on this kind of collection. Um, one by, yes, is um, that the major probably collected x when he he could do so and that's not so that would not give you a reflection of the breeding season but when the major wanted to collect x and that, that's a huge problem when you are uh, um, um dealing with um uh, when you want to talk about breeding seasonality but your second quick question uh, actually tends to address it a little bit when you have a lot of data, because it's in his own case, he collected, he was, he was a very ardent collector. So he collected eggs for several species and over quite a long time. So um, you would hope that the average timing of the average timing of breeding for that species will still be around the the true um, average, but then th there might be some kind of a big error margin, depending on how much X he collected on a particular um, year or, or, and on whether he was interested in still collecting the data. Obviously, when we look at the, the data, we see kind of spikes for different species at the different times of, of the year. And that's why for a description, like this, where we are just describing the breeding season. We are walking kicking across several years. So in his own case, from 1969 up until 2006, and we can see that there's a spread across the, uh, over different times for the data. And we are kind of calculating different things at the species, <laughs> uh, at the species level. So we are using like the start date, the spread, the mean, but also calculating the mode and the me median to the differently, and then clustering them over time to be able to still find the average um, time, which we expect is reflective of the actual breeding date, but even with a wide error margin. But the key for this kind of data is the fact that it's a lot of the data for several spe spe species, and we are um, interpreting a bit conservatively over a large number of species rather than pinning it down on a single species where the bias might affect it over a short time window. I hope I answered your question, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's great, thank you. Yeah, so thank you so much, uh, Chima, for, for that. And uh, sure, some of us have this question too. And I'm very sure we, are, we have received some level of clarification. And um, Tadia's hand is up. So please go ahead and ask your question. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Chima, for the enlightenment and the wonderful presentation. However, just the, the way Dr. Gabriel is said, I'm also quite concerned because I'm looking at what's the size of the trauma era itself. And if this major go at way to collect eggs whenever he wants, how far does it go? Owing to the fact that, because I was thinking the size here would matter owing to the fact that there's huge variation and how this phenology occurs, especially in the tropics. Did he collect the example in terms of trauma? Did you kind of factor that in? That's where I'm worried. And 
that I also agree with you that definitely breeding seasonality for tropical species is far more than just, it's not dependent on food availability or rainfall alone. I was just thinking probably the birds might be selecting a lot of other factors as well, which we are yet to explore. So does the size really matter? That's what I'm thinking about. Thank you. Okay, yeah, thank you. That's um, a yeah, very good question. See, well, in fact, um, here we, we were more concerned about reducing the size of the space from which data, because the major had like a collection from several other parts of Zambia. Yeah, because like Nigeria, you have also that gradient of environmental con con condition. So if you lo look at the entire data, you see that spatial component captured is in the since in the timing. But we actually cut the data to restrict the analysis to X collected within the Choma area alone. So around the majors farm and uh, and other farms that were around there, so that we limit the effect of the spatial variation in the timing of the of the breeding season, and then concentrate on the variation among species in their time. Me, me, me. So yes, I, 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 I agree with you. In very small, like even we saw from the common bubul in between Wepa and Cameroon, you already see huge differences in their timing. So for this study, we are more interested in describing the, the breeding clusters, why birds breed when they, they do. So like, how do different species fit into the different clusters? Then we use this information to see why you fall into cl cluster one or cluster two or cl cluster three. So for this, rather than try to even expand to capture the entire area of breeding seasonality, we worked within a smaller space where we assumed the environmental condition would not affect the variation among species very, very, very much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Chuan. I, I, I was also thinking when you mentioned of just within the raining season, you tend to have different birds having their peak breeding period at different periods of the rainy season for some early, some midway, and some later on. And then we're quite thinking, could this be based on availability of food for them feeding their youngs and so on? But I was just thinking, could it be the availability of nesting sites? Probably suitable nesting sites might also be a factor because for some of these species, the nesting site might be available when the vegetation is dry or it's less dense. Why for others, it could be when it is more dense. So I was just thinking, or for some, they want to breed at a point in time when prediction is low as well. So definitely I quite agree with you. It's not just based on rainfall and availability of food. Thank you. Yeah, yeah that's a uh... Yeah, um, spot on observation. One thing can also be the, the nest architecture. So, like open cup nesting species or cavity nesting spe species should favor nesting around the time when their nests will not be will, will not be uh, will not be flooded. Even if that's not the best, um, the most I mean, even if that's not the peak time to find uh, food, at, as far as their breeding requirements can be met, met. Yeah. the nest architecture might take priority over uh, peak food availability. And that's what we would be able to find that out when we do uh, trait-based analysis, bringing in um, the ecological and life history characteristics of each species and correcting for phylogenetic re, 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 re relationship, relationship among spe yeah. species. So you begin to see things like convergent evolution where 
species are not necessarily re related to each other, but um, they are doing things in the same way because of the kind of environment that they breed. Or where you have totally uh, distantly related uh, species having similar breeding um, hab be, 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 yeah, habits. So those we can see from the individual uh, traits, how much they contribute to putting a species in cluster one, two, or um, yeah, uh, right. three. And then we can see how that um, explains more or less relative to the relative to food availability, the timing of rainfall, temperature variation, and all the other environmental factors that we can pull together. In fact, even some species rely on fire. So until their place is burnt, they don't um, uh, lay. So there are so, so many um, things that can affect the timing of breeding at least for these Afrotropical spe species that we see. Thank you for your response. Yeah, you're welcome. Mm -hmm. All right, so thank you so much for that clarification, Chima. And there is a, a question from Oposio in the chat. Um, he wants to know if the collectors of these eggs uh, uh, go out to the field on a regular basis or um, they just go out whenever they feel like to collect those eggs. That's the number one question from him. But I think we, we have touched on that from the beginning. But then the second question is, did he, now the collector, record all the eggs he found in a clutch that were not collected or he just collected everything? Thank you very much for that uh, second question. So the we have two sets of the data from this site. So uh, one is which I've shown from this presentation are from the egg registers, but the major also kept a notebook of his observations and observations by some of the field assistants and uh, people who were um, searching for eggs and some bringing <laughs> and bringing this uh, eggs to him. Um, so that set of data we have not digitized. We would do that. And from my discussion with uh, my co 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 colleagues, that's um, able to increase the amount of da data we have by like about 100%. So, and that will even go a, a long way in ki kind of um, helping us to check whether the egg collection only reflects the true breeding seasonality of the species. And um, and then we help us even further to um, to fill up the blank spaces and then ask a second question, which we intend to ask whether the breeding season or the timing of the breeding has changed over uh, the time. So um, just a short answer. He had a notebook where he made records of breeding, and that we would also digitize and add to this to ask a second question about whether the breeding season has changed over time due to rainfall and temp preparation. Okay, thank you, Dr. Chima. I hope, Apulsio, you have your question answered. And if yeah, you're... thank you very much. Okay, all right. So thank you so much all for your questions. Do we still have more? questions to ask Dr. Chima or other observations to, to add? Okay, so um, if there is nothing coming up for now, okay. So generally, uh, or at the end, I would like to especially thank the speaker, Dr. Chima, thank you so much for 
creating time to to give us this brilliant presentation like i said from the beginning i i i was so curious about all of this and it's a great thing or opportunity to actually learn and to know that just beyond the normal thing that we know like it's, it just have to be food in the environment that will determine when birds will go out breeding. Now we know there is much more to it, you know, other environmental variables, you know, and also the phenogeny and then the unique traits of this bird species, they also contribute to what we see around. And in fact, sometimes, unfortunately, we use our own human point of view to try to interpret what is happening in nature. But then research like this can give us more an in-depth uh, idea as to what is happening. Well done, Dr. Chima and your entire team for doing this. And thank you again for creating time to give us this presentation. And for all that have joined the call today, thank you so much for creating time to, to join us. Hope we'll be able to join again in the next call, hopefully in August. So at this junction, I want to say, let's do have a brilliant evening and hopefully we'll see soon. Thank you so much. <laughs> Well, thank you, thank you.